My guest today is Ashley Janelle. Ashley, how are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing really well. What a beautiful day it is here in Chicago. Yes, so nice. Thank you so much for having me, David. Yeah. What do you do, Ashley? So I am a user experience designer and a UI designer, user interface designer at Amazon. Um, so essentially what user, so user experience is often shortened to UX, uh-huh. X is in xylophone. Um, UI, or excuse me, user interface is often shortened to UI. Um, so I like to distinguish the two between UX is how something works and UI is how it looks. So if you open up your phone and you go to the Maps app, um, if you click around to actually, you know, how easy is it to input an, an address? How easy is it to find, you know, an address of somewhere that you went yesterday? Um, that's the UX. That's how mm. something works. When you look at the app and you see the different colors and the scale of, you know, let's say how they the colors that they use to show that there's traffic when they usually use some sort of red color. Um, That's the UI. That's how it looks. So um, as a UX UI designer, I solve problems essentially for uh, wherever I'm working or clients and things like that right now. Like I said, I'm at Amazon. So uh, working to solve uh, some problems there that we're having. Okay. And we say that we're having, are we talking about the the user, the public facing website, the one that I use all the time? I want to go out and buy a new pair of shoes. I go to amazon.com and yeah, what? good question. Good question. So not working on the actual dot com. Um, I work on a tool that's actually a little bit more internal for sellers. Okay. So if you are a seller and you want to sell on Amazon, um, there is a website that you use and you can go and you can put in all of your SKU information. You can put input all of your storage information. Um, so I work on that tool specifically okay. to help sellers. Oh, that's interesting. I actually used that uh, tool, oh gosh, 10 or 11 years ago when I moved. Oh, wow. And I oh. had to upload a spreadsheet in a particular format to get all my stuff. I was trying to sell some of it through eBay, some of it through Amazon. Yeah. And it was clumsy at the time. It mm-hmm. was a it was a decent UI, but it wasn't a great UX 10 uh, years ago. Yeah, so that's <laughs> what we do. We we work to solve those kinds of... So when I say problems, those are the kinds of problems that I mean. Yeah. Uh, excellent. So, uh, UI and UX, you took my first question was the distinction between the two, because a lot of people just use them interchangeably, which Mm -hmm. is wrong, Right. but are the skills interchangeable? If you're good at one, are you good at the other? So not necessarily. Um, I started actually, I have a design background, um, a visual design background. So, um, before there were UX designers, there were web designers. You don't really hear that term anymore. Um, but you know, web designers essentially, were designers. We would design for, you know, websites. We knew about color. We knew about color theory, design principles, how to make a page balanced, things like that. Um, So taking those design skills and moving those over into user, user interface design was relatively easy because again, we're talking like design principles, um, how to make something look nice and inviting. However, user experience design is a little bit different in that it really gets into the psychology of how and why people use certain things. Um, So the way that I use an application might be different than the way you use the same application. Um, And so, you know, the way that I approach something might be different than the way that you approach something. So we really have to get into the psychology behind why people do the things they do, make the decisions that they make. And that drives us to um solving problems so it's not just a matter of well ashley thinks that sellers would like a tool that looks like this there's research that's involved there's lots of strategic um mapping and planning and and things that go into literally just solving one problem um so there's a lot of thought that goes into it there's a lot of of care there are a lot of steps that go into solving problems um and so yeah that's essentially the difference between the two now what i will say is that being a ux designer and learning those ux skills definitely makes for a better ui designer because Mm -hmm. I now know why colors should be the colors that they should be. When you look at like, let's say a form and there are two buttons right next to each other. One is usually, they should never really be the same color, right? Because 
your eye is just trained to click on a button. You may not necessarily look at the text. So sometimes we have to distinguish the buttons and make one look a little bit more attractive because this is the button that we want you to click versus the button yeah. that we may not necessarily want you to click. So having those the, skills. The, the buy okay. now button, for example. <laughs> the buy now button should be pretty and big and large on the page. Um, and so, yeah, so definitely having those skills makes for a better user interface designer. Interesting. Uh, my perception is that UX is actually a lot harder than UI because one, it incorporates a lot of the stuff from UI into it, and it's sort of both left brain and right brain. You know, there's the aesthetic part of it, and there's the psychology part of it where you have to understand the science of the people that you're trying to reach. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot more skills. So uh, again, like I said, I started off as a designer, so I was fortunate enough to kind of have that part down. Um, but I really liked the research part of the research and the strategy part because it allowed me to like get step away from design, something that I had been doing for years and use to your point, a different part of my brain that I wasn't really using. Um, when you're a researcher, you have to do things like type up research plans, which are sometimes long documents that outline the research plan that you're going to, to put forth. Um, you have to write research reports after that, you know, study has been conducted. Okay. What were the findings and share it out to the team or the company? Um, and, you know, same thing with strategy. Uh, we do a lot of like mapping techniques. So, you know, who's the person that says when you click on this button, it takes you to this page or, you know, when you go into a menu bar in a website, all of these are all the links that you're going to see. And then if you hover over one link, it's going to break down even more, you know, links that you can dive into. Like who's, who's the mastermind behind all of that. That's what we do. So it definitely allows you to, I like being in roles where I can do both because I still love design, but I also sometimes like to step away from it. And it just allows me to not get burnt out by one or the other. Uh, well, let's dive more into UX. Can you? Uh, this is a broad question, I know, but can you tell us some of the principles that you need to apply when you're designing for good user experience? Yeah, I think the 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 most important principle, um, and if you look look these up, depending on where you look, they may even look different. But essentially, it really boils down to um, being user centered. So that's one of them. Making sure that, again, like I said. I cannot design anything for the way that I would use it, even if I'm a user of the platform, which is very interesting, right? Because let's say um, I'm working at Instagram. I use Instagram. Mm -hmm. I can't design Instagram the way that I want to because I, in that moment, I'm not the user. So you yeah. have to really center the user and remove yourself, which is a very difficult skill to learn how to do. Um, UX is not necessarily easy to learn. It's definitely anyone can learn it. But you do kind of get to a point where you're like, oh, this is more involved than I thought it was going to be. Because removing yourself and not centering yourself is hard for humans to do. So um, that's one thing, um, being user-centered. Um, another thing is accessibility. And I don't think that that's something that we talk about enough, even as designers, you would think that we would. But accessibility is it can be a range of things. So how accessible is what you're designing? Um, for example, I like to give the example of, you know, I am a millennial. So I kind of grew up with the internet, but my grandparents did not. The internet was kind of forced onto them. Now everything is done online. All of their doctor's appointments are done online. Anytime you get in, you know, sign up for something, you get an email and there's a link that you have to click and it takes you back to something. And it's like, how do we make these experiences that we all have to be a part of accessible for someone like me? And also accessible for someone who maybe is older or maybe has a vision impaired, um, you know, has a sense of vision impairment. So that's another part of it, of um, UX principles that we don't talk, talk enough about. And again, even as designers, I don't think that we, I think that we can do a much better job across the board. And then just lastly, I'll say um, one of the other um, principles is usability, uh, which is kind of like an obvious one, but it's, you know, it, it goes back to user, things being user centered. Um, so how usable is this product? So you built it, you designed it, but how usable is it? And that's why we do things like testing. When I, going back to the, the UX, the user researcher, oftentimes 
part of what they're doing is they're testing the designs that we or the solutions because UX is not always a digital design. It could be restaurant design. It could be concerts. It can be anything that you experience. Um, a user experience designer or someone with those skills can work on those projects as well. So making sure that something is usable is very important as well. And we like to test things. So we rarely just create something and then put it out. Um, we test it along the way with various people so that we can get feedback and we can make changes and iterations before we actually spend money on it to build it. Wow, this is interesting. That's a lot that you talked about here. I, uh, <laughs> uh, well, that's good. <laughs> you mentioned designing for different audiences, and I, how is that even possible? You know, you have. Um, do we have to create separate inter user interfaces for? people that are vision impaired versus those who are not or those who are maybe um, not used to the internet versus those who grew up with it. Uh, you know, I'll give my example here. I really much prefer typing on a keyboard, sitting down on a computer or a laptop than typing anything on a phone. You brought mm -hmm. up Instagram. That instantly came to mind. Instagram, until recently, the only way you could interact with it was through your phone. Yeah. And uh, they just recently added a, a website where you could you could read it, but you couldn't mm -hmm. post anything unless right. you went into the browser tools and pretended it was a phone, which mm -hmm. I often did. And maybe <laughs> that's a generational thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, but uh, anyway, that's that's just my example of uh, there's two different audiences, and they, and they have different needs. How do you address that? So it's a really great question, and I think there are a few ways of looking at it or approaching it. One is that. For the most part, we have to make sure that, again, this is situational. So use going back to the example of, like, let's say your doctor's office. Doctor's offices typically are not going to make one app for people who are pretty advanced at using their phones and people who are not. So what you have to do is make sure that you have an app that is sim simple enough to work for multiple audiences. Um, so that requires a lot of testing, a lot of knowing your users, because when you have a ton of users, when you have a large user pool, it gets a little bit more tricky because now you're designing for multiple groups of people versus kind of, to my example, if you're kind of on the seller side of Amazon, you might have a particular skill set. Um, you know, you might be within a particular age group. Um, so the, the pool of users demographically or generationally might be a little bit smaller. But for the most part, we have to design for everyone. Now, there are instances where... Um, companies or tools will build something specific for specific groups. For example, people who don't necessarily like a bright screen, most uh, computers and phone companies have now giving you like a dark mode or they have changed, they have accessibility features. Let's say you are you know, vision impaired and you need, uh, you rely heavily on vibrations and um, haptics and things like that. They can build things in to help that accessibility as well. And then lastly, one thing that Apple has done recently is they have an actually like a, a new home screen that is a completely pared down version than the one that we have. Now, you may think that if you have an iPhone, what's on your screen is pretty simple. You know, you have all of your apps and it's pretty easy to navigate. But for someone who may be overwhelmed by that, a more simplistic pared down version could be better for them. So we can do a little bit of both. Um, but oftentimes the rule of thumb is to try to design for your audience as a whole. Interesting. So I think a, one of the things you mentioned is having features that you can turn on and turn off, like dark mode, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or accessibility features that uh, maybe I don't need them, but my cousin who is vision impaired, she can turn them on, something like that. Yeah. You mentioned that you were not, uh, you didn't start out as a UX designer. You started out as a designer, more visual, artistic. Uh, how did you learn that? Or how, do you, how what advice would you give to somebody that wants to get involved in this field? Yeah, so for me personally, I actually took a boot camp um, and I found great value in taking a boot camp because I saw the value in what it could offer me. Um, it was a, I'm a big fan of give me the material and teach it to me. Um, and, you know, let me sign up, give me the material, teach it to me, let me see what the outcome is the outcomes are. Um, outcomes are, you know, you have a portfolio at the end. We help you with networking. We help you to land roles and things like that. Um, I'm a big fan of that. Um, so that's the role that I took was a boot camp. 
um, to get the the additional skills that I did not have because I already had the the visual design skills. There's also a self-taught method. So you can also go online. Online is a great resource. Um, and essentially, if you are self-taught, what you're doing is you are scouring the internet for articles, videos, anything that you can grasp to, to essentially teach yourself all of these skills. You can take one-off courses that, you know, maybe nine, 10, $20 um, to learn certain things, but essentially you're teaching yourself. Um, however, the boot camp route was right for me because again, big fan of, of here's the material, let me teach it to you. And then also here is when, here's your start date and here's your end date. Um, and it was about a, it was about a 10 week boot camp, And that was perfect for me because I wanted to make sure that I could, you know, move on to finding a job as soon as possible. Well, self-taught route takes a little bit longer. Uh, the, the the challenge of uh, finding things on the internet isn't that there there's not enough. The challenge is filtering it down and finding the time to oh, yeah. use it. <laughs> Whereas bootcamp does that filtering for you. Uh, give a shout out. Who was the bootcamp? Yeah, General Assembly. That's okay. I'm not familiar with them, but they're local mm -hmm. here in Chicago. Uh, yeah, they're actually national. They're oh, national. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then uh, talk a little bit about the portfolio, because I, I know um, I saw you give a talk at the Juneteenth conference a couple of weeks ago downtown. And um, the one thing that stuck out in my mind was uh, probably the biggest thing that stuck out was uh, uh, your advice to people who have a portfolio. Um, yeah. Talk about that. So, yeah. So I started at Amazon um about a year and a half ago almost. And at this point, I'm a pretty senior designer. Um, I was working at Caterpillar for five years. I had recently been promoted at Caterpillar into a new role, but the role of Amazon came into, <laughs> into my life. And I was like, you know, I think that's the direction that I want to go. And so here I am, this seasoned designer. I also teach, uh, you know, UX. I have a boot camp of my own. So I, oh, I do this. Right. And oh, so send, send me a link to your bootcamp. I'll put it in the show notes. OK, definitely. I will. Um, but I'm just kind of painting this picture because here I am putting together my portfolio to send to Amazon. Um, well, actually, I was putting my portfolio together for the role at Caterpillar and then kind of snowballed into Amazon. Yeah. But here I am putting together my portfolio. And what happens is you just get so overwhelmed because putting together a portfolio is a lot of work. It's a series of several case studies. The case studies are very long and very detailed. And oftentimes what we don't do is document things as we're actually working on the project. Um, you do in a, in a boot camp setting, but not necessarily in the the real world it's like you're just kind of going to work doing you know your work and it kind of the project you know wraps and things like that so I send the portfolio to one of my friends who's also a UX designer and she's like you know this is great and I was just like oh I don't know and she's like listen your portfolio doesn't have to be perfect it just has to be good enough and that stuck with me because nothing that we and I don't want to say nothing but there are very there are not too many times where we do something and it's perfect because if you had a few more days or a few more weeks or a few more months to work on it, I'm sure you can get it just, you know, just a little bit better. But the point of your portfolio is to demonstrate your skills, your knowledge and your talent and that you have ability to solve problems. And that does not have to necessarily be packaged in the perfect way. As long as your format is good, you're getting the ideas across and you're kind of checking the boxes that you need in a portfolio, it's fine. Send it off. And you can continue to iterate on your portfolio, you know, if you'd like to. But the idea of it not being perfect, but being just good enough is probably the best advice. And anyone who is putting together a portfolio for a job, that probably resonates with them because you do get to a point where it's like, I can't even look at this thing anymore. I can't <laughs> write another word. I'm not, you know, I'm not a writer. Um, and there's a ton of writing that goes into it. And so um, there is a point where you have to say, you know what, this is good. Um, and I'm going to send it off. Excellent. Yeah, that was the part that I starred on in my notes next to it. That uh, Because it not only applies to your portfolio, it applies to almost everything in life. Is that almost everything. You can, you never really get to perfect. You just run out of time, and you need to acknowledge that in your head. It's, okay. Yes. Yes, it could be better, but if nobody sees it, it's worthless. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. 
All right. Hey, are you doing any more speaking? Um, I don't think that I have anything coming up. Um, nothing that I can think of, but I'm always kind of doing things like, like your show. Um, I do a lot of speaking on TikTok, uh-huh. um, and, and some other social media places, but nothing coming up. All right. Well, I actually, I really appreciate your time here and you stay safe. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks so much, David, for having me. What I try to tell friends of mine about careers in in the technology industry is to just explore all avenues. I'm a designer, but design is not the only role. There's, you know, development is not the only role. There's cybersecurity. There's so many roles that fall with under technology. Um, it's just really important to know what's out there, know what's available. Don't do just what you see someone else doing just because it, you know, they have a, a technology um, title next to their name. There's so many different roles and they're all great to check out and explore.